Alrighty, alrighty. It has been a long while um, since I've devoted something to an in-depth look at an article, but this is going to be one of those days. Uh, it's time to have a deep dive into In Defense of Merit in Science, published in the Journal of Controversial Ideas, April 2023. Let's go on a deep dive, shall we? Let's go. So, uh, if you've seen me on Twitter tweeting about this, it certainly has been interesting. It's certainly caught the attention of a number of people. And because of that, uh, <laughs> this is going to be quite a fair bit longer than I would normally do. It is a lengthy article. as of my print copy right here. It's uh, just the main article itself tops out at uh, 26 pages. Um and they write in here a number of different things, and so we're going to get into it. Um, so pardon me, I'm probably going to be looking back and forth between my paper here and the PDF copy of the article that I have here present, on which I've done some highlighting. Um, and I've also decided to add in at particular points um, other things of note that I think should uh, could be added here. Um, to make the point um, all the more that the authors are making. Um, and this is, uh, lead author here is Dorian Abbott, whom you all may be quite familiar with at this point, um, because of the issues with MIT and what have you some time ago. And one of the co-authors, and uh, according to many of the other authors, really instrumental in making this run, run through here is uh, Anna Kralov, is here also. But uh, this list of authors is quite a who's who. Some of these names are very familiar. Um, Peter Bogosian being one of them here. Uh, Luana Marosia. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Uh, Lee Jissom. Um, John McHorter right here. Glenn Lowry. Um, quite a who's who of many different uh, groups of people. Very different backgrounds not at all the same disciplines <laughs> in here as it were there. Cause I know Dorian's a climate person. Anna's a, um, Anna is a chemist. And then there's a couple of other different disciplines in here, um, that are from the humanities. Like Lee is a psychologist. So, um, in this here, in this here article. So as always, we'll go in through the abstract, but I'm going to be flipping back and forth a little bit, um, between this here and, that up there and also adding in some other context, but I'm hoping to review the basic, um, basic bits of importance in the article, um, as well as to point out a few things of relative importance, give some of my thoughts on maybe some things there could have been some improvements. Um, cause I do think on reading this, I do think there's a couple of things that I would critique at least. Um, no surprise to anybody here that this is coming from, um, from a perspective that I also would take that merit is important in science and that science itself is uh, centered around per primary purpose of science is about finding the truth. Um, so no surprise there, but I have tried to point out some things that I think could be very much improved, um, could be added on to. Um, but on the whole, what I will say up front is, as I said, it's 26 pages of which I think, how many pages of this is actual article per se? Uh, 20 pages of actual article content, six pages of references totaling, I think there was 150, yeah, 149 citations total um, in here, which is quite a lot of depth to it. And um, there's actually a whole supplemental section, which we will get to also. So first up, one abstract. <clears throat> Merit is a central pillar of liberal epistemology, humanism, and democracy. The scientific enter enterprise built on merit has proven effective in generating scientific and technological advances, reducing suffering, narrowing social gaps, and improving the quality of life globally. This perspective documents the ongoing attempts to undermine the core principles of liberal epistemology and to replace merit with non-scientific, politically motivated criteria. We explain the philosophical origins of this conflict, document the intrusion of ideology into our scientific institutions, discuss the perils of abandoning merit, and offer an alternative 
human-centered approach to addressing uh, to address existing social inequalities. All right, that is quite a mouthful. Um, and if you're following along on Twitter, there were a number of prominent scientists that retweeted um, the article that retweeted the Wall Street Journal article um, that Anna and Jerry Coyne wrote um, to accompany this. And the reason they wrote it, we will get to a little bit later on, um, because it involves something quite shameful, all of the same issues that made, um, same thing along the lines of the American Physical Society's shameful decision not to publish a rebuttal to a dis piece of crap article. See the last side chat Saturday if you want more information on that. But let us get into it here. We live in an incredible time in human history. As Barack Obama said, quote, if you had to choose one moment in history in which you could be born and you didn't know ahead of time who you were going to be, what nationality, what gender, what race, whether you'd be rich or poor, gay or straight, what faith you'd be born into, you would choose right now, end quote. While the benefits of significant global progress and economic development have not been shared equally, the world as a whole has never been healthier, wealthier, better educated, and in many ways more tolerant and less violent than it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something to point out, is that a lot of our... Um, a lot of the postmodernist scholarship that... <laughs> that is causing so much trouble actually seems to be, I think it was Bill Maher who said progressive phobic as it were. Um, but doesn't seem to acknowledge that a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, the world today is so much better than it was. Um, and then particularly if you're thinking about, if thinking about the difference between, you know, what you'd have to deal with, um, in the past versus now, yeah, you know, this is a much better time and place than it was um, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. So what they go on to with the introduction here, um, I'm, I'm not going to belabor it here too much, is that they're talking about the fact that one of the reasons, one of the big reasons for the progress that we have made globally has been the scientific enterprise. Well, yes, the sci science is the for the pursuit of the truth. Yes. But in that vein, when you're pursuing the truth, you can do a lot of really powerful things in helping society. So that's what they're getting at with this particular section. Um, of course, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Indeed, science holds the key to solving these problems. It provides a basis for renewable energy technologies, mitigating anthropogenic impact on global climate, on the global climate, I should say, feeding the world's growing population, controlling pandemics, and eradicating debilitating diseases. Of course, science alone is not sufficient. Science is but a tool that can be used for good and bad. It is our responsibility as a society to use it responsibly, ethically, and effectively. Now, I'm getting at a point that I've made a few times, actually, um, in that science is a process by which you get at the truth. That said, you can do some horrific things with it. So, like for example, the Belmont Report came about because of vicious and horrific scientific experimentation um, in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s um, <laughs> that were just utterly horrific and you couldn't imagine it happening now. Um, and for such things as uh, maybe also could be included in this is the Reimer twins experiment under John Money probably would not have happened had the had some kind of facet of the Belmont report existed, but that's a whole other whole other conversation. Um, but that's the point there is it's, it's like it is a tool that can be used both ways, and it can be used pretty horrifically if you're not dealing with it ethically and setting some bounds with that. Um, in contrast. Fulfilling this responsibility, however, is being hindered by a new alarming clash between liberal epistemology and identity-based ideologies. Liberal epistemology prizes free and open inquiry, values vigorous discourse and debate, and determines the best scientific ideas by separating those that are true from those that are likely not. The statuses, identities, and demographics of scientists are irrelevant to this great sifting of valid versus invalid ideas. 
In contrast, identity-based ideologies seek to replace these core liberal principles essential for scientific and technological advances with principles derived from postmodernism and critical social justice, CSJ, which assert that modern science is, quote, racist, patriarchal, and colonial, end quote, and a tool of oppression rather than a tool to promote human flourishing and the common good. In this perspective, we explain the differences between the two epistemologies and argue that meritocracy, grounded in philosophical liberal epistemology, however imperfect, is the best and fairest way to conduct science. We endorse policies to mitigate existing inequalities of opportunities, but explain why CSJ-based policies are pernicious. CSJ differs from social justice as a concept. Therefore, we offer a liberal, humanistic alternative that is compatible with maximizing scientific advances. So the point here for them is not just to point out that, uh, hey, this, this, this way that we've been going about dealing with these inequalities is going to end badly. That's not the only thing they're pointing out. But um, they're also offering an alternative. And I'm going to fully take a wager here that this is probably, um, probably some of Dorian's doing because it's notable in his writings that he very much tries to offer up solutions. Um, when we get to that, I have some more to say there because I think there's one other thing that's been getting ignored and I've been hinted, I've hinted at it multiple times um, that needs to happen. And I think the folks who are in the positions to do something with this in academia definitely most, uh, most blah, excuse me, most definitely have the capacity to do that far more uh, than I do, um, per se, or far more than any young scientist does. Now, let's see. <clears throat> Section 2, Merit-Based Science is Effective and Fair. Why science is an engine that propels societies to health, wealth, and prosperity, ultimately saving and improving lives worldwide, is well understood. The cornerstone of science is the notion that objective truth exists and can be understood through observation, experiment, and iterative hypothesis generation. Because objective truth exists, ultimate consensus among truth-seeking actors, scientists, is possible. And I also want to make this a point here. A natural consensus. There's a difference between a natural consensus and a forced consensus. A natural consensus means you're all seeing the same thing and coming to the same conclusion with the evidence. A forced consensus is, well, the kind of pushing aside anything that disagrees kind of approach. That's the distinction I want to make there. The scientific method has proved an effective tool for revealing objective truths about the natural world. These truths are not final and immutable, but provisional, open to challenge and refinement as knowledge expands. Now, this is basic, this is basic science philosophy in that, yeah, you can find something out. Uh, oh, gosh, who was it who said it? I think it was Einstein actually, who said it at one point, and it epitomized the idea very well. Um, no amount of experiments can prove me right, but one single experiment can prove me wrong. And that's what he was getting at. Is, yes, you can have repeated things that intend to confirm stuff and what have you, but then you can also have one thing that comes along and ends up refuting the whole dang thing with when it survives scrutiny, of course, uh, refuting the whole dang original phenomena here and that's what they get into with um with a bunch of the examples they have after that for example quantum mechanics has shown that laws governing the motion of billiard balls and planets are not sufficient to describe the motion of nuclei and electrons yet the schrodinger equation does not invalidate newton's laws which we continue to use to engineer cars airplanes and rockets Rather, quantum mechanics has expanded our understanding of reality by revealing that classical mechanics is limited to the macroscopic world. New knowledge. The scientific method is the core of liberal epistemology. The Constitution In the Constitution of Knowledge, Jonathan Rausch, I don't know why just Rausch, Jonathan Rausch addresses the current epistemological crisis by reaffirming the central tenets of liberal epistemology developed by Popper, Albert, Weber, and others. Now, take a momentary pause here just to plug the book the constitution of knowledge by jonathan Rausch is an excellent book and if you really want to get a good understanding of classical liberalism classical liberal epistemology that underlies not just science but legal and other otherwise too uh that is an excellent book to read namely that provisional truth is attainable 
and that a truth claim can be made only if it is testable and withstands attempts to debunk it. The fa- fallibilist rule, which is to say, is it something that is falsifiable and how would you falsify it if it were not true? He also emphasized, you know, just to- this is where the thing about falsifiability comes in. I believe that's specifically from Karl Popper, if I remember correctly. He also emphasizes that no one has personal authority over a truth claim, nor can one claim authority by a virtue of a personally or tribally privileged perspective, the empirical rule. Similarly, truth claims cannot be less valid by virtue of the claimant's membership in any particular group, which is to say in the point here, which is here at the end of the paragraph, in liberal epistemology, the validity of truth claims can only be evaluated by evidence and the logic of inferential processes linking that evidence to further conclusions, which is to say it doesn't give a damn thing what you look like. (laughs) That's exactly the point here with the liberal epistemology. It does not matter what you look like um, in all this kind of nonsense. Well, not nonsense. It doesn't matter what you look like when you're going after, when you're pursuing the truth. That's not the purpose here. Let's see. Evaluating the quality of evidence or the validity of inferential processes is itself a social process, a point upon which some liberal and feminist philosophers agree. Both Rausch's and Longino's perspective, which uh, no one has final say, scientific truths are determined by an ongoing social process that includes discussion, debate, and criticism until a broad consensus is reached and which can be challenged by new evidence and arguments. Although both perspectives permit all members to participate in the social process of truth-seeking, In neither perspective is truth determined by the group-based identities of the claimant. Further, reality-based scientific communities must be open to conceding and correcting errors. The objective, the ability of science to self-correct, one reason that scientific truth claims are credible. Self-correction is facilitated by pluralism to maintain intellectual diversity and maximize the chances of uncovering provisional truths. Intellectual diversity ensures vigorous skepticism vigorous skeptical vetting of scientific claims by a critical mass of doubters who ultimately accept being bound by objective truths once that they have been rigorously determined by extensive evidence. Which is to say they withstood being debunked up until the point that they are sometimes eventually debunked. There's a falsifiability thing there, so it's not quite right to say rigorously determined by extensive evidence. They are accepted until there is some such thing where they end up being falsified. Um, that is probably more accurate to the way um, Popper has, uh, Karl Popper would put it, but um, I would defer to other philosophers of science. So at this point, they've made the whole claim about this is what... Um, This is what a liberal epistemology is. You think objective truth is real and knowable. You can go after it. Um, You know, provisional truth of falsifiability kind of thing um, here. That nobody is privileged by virtue of their personhood or their... You don't have a privileged perspective. Your perspective is not any better than anybody else's. Um, Validity of claims is is evaluated by evidence. Um, and logic of inferential processes linking that evidence to conclusions. Um, truth is not determined by... Pro- I already said the thing about that. but um, And there's also self-correction, the self-correction that is dependent upon... Um, dependent upon pluralism, as it were, which means having a multitude... having intellectual diversity. These core principles, which have served us well for centuries, are under attack by ideologies originating in postmodernism and critical theory versions of which reject objective reality in favor of multiple narratives promulgated by different identity groups and alternative ways of knowing. They engender radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is obtainable, and a commitment to cultural constructivism, which asserts that knowledge and reality are products of their cultural context. When claims about lived experiences and subjectivism are proposed to better to constitute a better basis for understanding the world than empirical evidence and facts, the identity of the participants in a discourse becomes more important than the substance of the arguments or the strength of the evidence, and objectively adjudicating claims becomes impossible. So, this is where we start getting into the fun stuff. So, you made the point. We made the point there basically with one of the things with the critical theory kind of thing is the biggest thing, the biggest way that I've ever found the sub. Um, okay, hard time talking. Um, critical theory versus 
uh, liberal epistemology. Liberal epistemology thinks the truth exists, and science is there doing its job of pursuing the truth. Critical theory doesn't care about what the truth is. It cares about power and who is making the statement. Who is making the statement matters much more than what the statement is, if you're coming at it from a critical theory and postmodernist perspective. Uh, rather than what the statement is and whether or not the statement has any bearing in connection to the real world. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm actually going to... There is a critique I have here that um, that needs to be... I think That I think the authors probably would, uh, would be interested in addressing. So, such ideologies suffer from at least two serious philosophical problems. The first is that their rejection of objectivity undermines their credibility. If there is no objectivity, then their claims can are not objectively true. If their claims cannot possibly be objectively true, there's no reason for anyone to believe them. Their claims warrant serious consideration only if they might actually be true, which requires at least the possibility of objectivity. So, thinking, thinking of what a postmodernist might say with this, is that, um, well... Why should I care if I'm rejecting objectivity, if I don't think objectivity really exists anyway? Um, here, why should it matter? I don't think objectivity really exists anyway. It's all a cultural construct. It's all a construct of society. So what is true is actually a construction of what you're experiencing in society. So why should I care if I'm rejecting objective reality in favor of the social constructionist kind of approach? See, see, the thing is, if they don't think, if they don't think objective reality is actually in existence, why would they even care? Why would a postmodernist even care that they are rejecting so-called objectivity? And oftentimes, as I would point out in another document, um, objectivity is itself considered, oh, I don't know. Something under whiteness, I believe, is what is uh, talked about at one point. Um, so again, why would why would they care that they're rejecting it if they're already? Why would they care in the least of it? I think um, in the eyes of people that value objectivity themselves and do think the real the real world actually exists, yes, that's a philosophical problem. But do the postmodernists actually? care in that particular instance i do not know anyway uh that that's a thought that occurs to me when i was reading this and so it's one thing to get around this is like why should we care that objective reality exists now we do because we can actually measure things and you know test our theories against the real world which we're about to get to here in a second um and that actually helps with the merit part of it anyway uh, the second is that these philosophies conflict with a set of principles of modern science known as the Mertonian norms. Merton, a founder of sociology of science, formulated these principles based on his analysis of factors that enabled the scientific revolution and explained that they are dictated by the goals of science. Indeed, following these principles has served science well, as we argue below. A departure from these ideas has a long history of harming science. Okay. They lay these out here, um, and I'm not going to read them off here. You can read them on the screen while I'm talking. But I had to make a point here um, with this graphic, which, thank you for the graphic. It is so wonderful. Um, actually, I'm going to use that a couple of different places, I think, going forward myself. Um, one thing I wanted to say with this. Um, so I am myself relatively young in my PhD. I got my PhD a little over six years ago. Um, but I want to make a point with this, and I think I've said it a few times on this channel, but, uh, just to make the, make the point quite clearly, these norms, these Martonian norms, the ideas with Karl Popper and all that kind of nonsense, well, not all the kind of nonsense, I apologize for that, all that kind of great stuff, I did not learn any of that concept-wise until after I got my PhD until after I graduated, none of this stuff here with the norms and what have you 
starting i started my bachelor's degree in 2004 um you know Bachelor started in 2004, started my master's in 2009, started my PhD in 2012. Um, nowhere in that journey, undergrad or grad school, was I ever offered even a course where I could learn that. Nowhere was that happening. And that is a serious problem because you are there's teaching of the next generation of scientists going on and you're teaching them you know, foundational knowledge of psychology and chemistry and all that kind of stuff, but you're not teaching those that really want to go into being scientists about these things and why they are good and important, about scientific merit and why it is good and important, about objectivity and why, you know, why it is such a cornerstone of the liberal epistemology and of science in general. Um, that's a bad thing. And I would love to see more of that to be truthful from, from the authors. Um, together, the Mertonian principles imply that merit must be the key, to, key metric to judge and evaluate scientific claims. The ultimate test of merit of a claim is its ability to accurately predict the functioning of the universe as elucidated through replicable experiment and observation, not whether it feels right or comports with a particular worldview or group interest. Ideological orthodoxies deserve no place in science. One of the critiques I've seen in this article come up is that, well, it's, it's everything. You have a social objective judgment of merit and what have you. The ultimate test of merit is exactly what they're saying. If you're making a science claim and you, if you're making a claim based upon your theory and your argument, um, then you use that to try and predict what's going to happen next in a similar situation. If you can, if you can accurately predict off of that, then that's awesome. You just really established incredibly solid evidence for your claim. Your claim is meritorious. That's none of that's dependent upon what ideology. None of that's dependent upon any of the demographic characteristics. None of it. That is not subjective. That's entirely objective. At least if you're working with the notion that objective reality exists and is knowable that goes back to the other problem <laughs> scientific truths are universal and independent of the personal attributes of the scientist scientist science knows no whoopsie science knows no ethnicity gender or religion of course by itself universalism does not prevent the personal views of scientists which are influenced by culture and society from affecting the practice of science indeed scientists have not always lived up to the ideals of fairness and impartiality in evaluating merit in the past, scientific culture has contributed to the exclusion of various groups from the scientific enterprise. However, the shortcoming of individuals over or the community should not be confused with the science itself. Although there are no there are feminist critiques of how glaciologists have conducted themselves, there's no such thing as feminist glaciology, just as there is no queer chemistry, Jewish physics, white mathematics, indigenous science, or feminist astronomy. Glacial, physical, genetic, or prehistoric phenomena are independent of the positionality of the scientist. By priori prioritizing the truth value of scientific research, personal influences of individual scientists are minimized. Now, this is the point to make here is that, again, it that's the point they're making with this. If you're looking at it, whether or not it's objectively true, it doesn't give a damn what the demographic of the scientist is. Are scientists perfect? No, they are human. But one of the reasons also that you say here that you should not confuse the shortcomings of individuals or even groups of individuals with science itself is because, yes, scientists actually do acknowledge that we have our individual biases here. But our biases are not all the same either. <laughs> our biases are not all identically the same. And so one of the things with the principles of organized skepticism or what have you is one person is checking against another person. Those two people may have completely different biases and therefore you end up pushing the whole thing in the research side towards what is the a provisional truth of the research or closer to objective reality, figuring out what the truth is, which is the telos of science. So... <clears throat> 
Oh, yes. I, I know now why this section is green. It took me a second to remember why I had put that in green. But first, I want to mention something. Merit is a vehicle for upward mobility, recruiting, developing, and, and by the way, this is going to be a long video if you haven't figured it out already, Pr developing and promoting individuals based on their talent, skills, and achievements has enabled many who started life in disadvantaged conditions to realize their dreams and build better lives. While some might argue that CSJ has improved science by disrupting barriers to entry for marginalized groups, those barriers have been falling for decades without any help from CSJ dogmas and long before CSJ rose to prominence and power. For example, in 1970, women received about 10% of all doctoral degrees in the U.S. By 2006, they were receiving the majority. Now, to add to that, this study was published just recently, um, Psychological Science in the Public Interest, uh, the Association of Psychological Sciences, uh, CC here, 2003. And this was a very, very long and in-depth study <laughs> that they got into here. But uh, allow me to briefly read the abstract for you. Exploring gender bias in six key domains of academic science and adversarial collaboration. We synthesized the vast contradictory scholarly literature on gender bias in academia and academic science from 2000 to 2020. In the most prestigious journals and media outlets, which influence many people's opinions about sexism, bias is frequently portrayed as an omnipresent factor limiting women's progress in the tenure-track academy. Claims and counterclaims regarding the presence or absence of sexism span a range of evaluation contexts. Our approach relied on a combination of meta-analysis and analytic dis dissection. We evaluated the empirical evidence for gender bias in six key contexts in the tenure-track academy. A, tenure-track hiring, B, grant funding, C, teacher ratings, uh, teaching ratings, D, journal acceptances, E, salaries, and F, recommendation letters. We also explored a gender gap in a seventh area, journal productivity, because it can moderate bias in other contexts. We found on these specific domains in which sexism has most often been alleged to be pervasive, we focused on these specific domains in which sexism has most often been alleged to be pervasive, because they represent important types of evaluation, and the extensive research corpus within these domains provides sufficient quantitative data for a comprehensive analysis. Contrary to the omnipresent claims of sexism in these domains appearing in top journals and the media, our findings show that tenure-track women are at parity with tenure-track men in three domains, grant funding, journal acceptances, and recommendation letters, and are advantaged over men in a fourth domain, hiring. For teaching ratings and salaries, we find evidence of bias against women, although gender gaps in salary were much smaller than often claimed, they were nevertheless concerning. Even in the four domains in which we failed to find evidence of sexism disadvantaging women, yeah, okay, we acknowledge, okay, we acknowledge, nonetheless acknowledge that broad societal structural factors may still impede women's advancement in academic sciences, academic science, given the substantial research directed toward reducing gender bias in academic science, it is imperative to develop a clear understanding of when and where such efforts are justified and how resources can be best directed to mitigate sexism where it exists. So in other words, which is to say some other things have gotten corrected too. Now, um, this is a point actually, yes, I wanted to, I highlighted that one in green because I actually like, like the other one. I had a point here. I wanted to make that might be directed at the authors. In order to achieve a more fair and equitable scientific community, we should strengthen meritocratic practices. It would be unjust and pernicious not to identify and nurture talent wherever it may be found. Prioritizing merit-based science does not preclude other actions to enhance inclusivity, an issue we'd return to later. Okay. Uh, my question here is, um, I, got, I got a pretty... Pretty sure the I'm pretty sure the authors have a specific meaning, but what do you mean by equitable? What do you mean in this case by equity? I'm believing that, ju judging from the fact that they are coming at this from the liberal epistemological perspective, they probably uh, would define equity as the uh, equal opportunity, which it is. Um, that is the right definition for it, as opposed to the definition that is either used implicitly or explicitly, as uh, the American Meteorological Society put actually in their particular report, where it would be equality of outcomes. Um, and so that's a point of clarification. I think from the way this is written, they mean equality of opportunity when they have equitable here, but um, specifically the definition of equity. Um, but 
that is for them to define. That one I don't know from, from the reading here, and it was a, a note that caught my attention. <clears throat> the primacy of merit-based scientific truths claims r- truth claims raises the following question. How can we apply merit consistently and effectively? Judgment may be affected by personal preferences, blind spot, and biases, yet there are established good practices that have been honed and refined over decades. Good practices currently use a combination of quantitative metrics and qualitative assessment, e.g. letters from reviewers assessing how influential, original, and innovative the work is. Uh, How, then, can the potential for bias be mitigated so that even subjective judgments have a laser-like focus on merit? We suggest that two questions are central to the evaluation for scientific of scientific merit. See figure two. How important is the finding? How strongly does the evidence presented indicate that the main claims are true? Now, this is where I have seen commentary come up online. Well, this this is where the subjectiveness centers in, and where a person's biases make merit unfeasible, and you will. Um, sort of the implicit bias notion. And so I'm, I'm surprised that I was surprised when I read this, cause I'm, I'm pretty sure the authors are aware of that argument, um, that it didn't end up getting discussed here. I saw it get discussed later. And that is the point that, uh, implicit bias doesn't necessarily work all that well <laughs> as a concept. Um, and even the, te- in the, the measurements, the tests uh, to measure it, aren't great either and have no predictive power when it comes to behavior. So it doesn't necessarily work well anyway. And the other point, the other point that they already made, which I think actually makes the, um, also pushes back against the subjective notion is if the claim being made, you know, it has replication in the real world, then it doesn't matter what the bias sees of the authors are necessarily. It doesn't matter what the biases of the reviewers are. They're saying like, oh, I, I, you'd be sitting there saying like, oh, I don't think that's really gonna happen in real. Oh, you demonstrated it right over here. Well, damn, could be something like that. Um, and so I think that notes it there, but this is something that that's a point of weakness that I saw with their article um, that it probably should have gotten addressed more right here when you're putting forward this thing of, this is how we're going to go about, you know, this is how we suggest going about making sure subjective judgments um, are based on merit. Would be to point out those things. The other thing I would also go back to, the fact that oftentimes these reviews, whether it be peer review or otherwise, are not done by a single person where you could have a particular problem with a bias, but they're done by multiple people where you go back then to the collective issue of the pursuit of science where you have people with competing biases. And this is why organized skepticism becomes important. Competing in different biases and preferences for what is good, what is good and what is important. And this is where you get into argumentation about these things. The key is the, is that focusing on the importance of the finding and the strength of the evidence can limit to bias. Yes. The identity or positionality of the authors is irrelevant. Yeah. Um, and so I made a note here about the implicit bias thing. Okay. So the, the main point of what they're saying here is that this whole third section was just about, uh, dealing with merit, dealing with, you know, how do you work with it? Those kinds of things, things that are good to actually have very much talked about. And again, again, as I said previously, stuff not taught. Frankly, it's not taught about in your undergraduate science courses, and it's not taught about in graduate school science courses either. Needs to be. uh, Needs to be. Um, And so I would uh, mention that over and over and over again, um, because I think a lot of professors who are still in academia, um, you have more capacity to do that uh, level of development and coursework development and offering those courses than I do. Um, So hence the reason I push it for you though I will do my best uh, here on YouTube also. Um, and so the point that they make with this is focusing on the strength of the evidence, focusing on the claim made, and if the findings of a study are um, major advancements in knowledge, if you will. Um, breaking through the boundaries, hitting hitting to new frontiers, 
things along that line. If that's if that's there, and what that is to, is somewhat different for a scientific dif- discipline, uh, which is a fair notion, and that is a caveat to playing with this. This is a question that I would ask them because you've acknowledged that there's a difference based upon the discipline, but now more of these more studies, more and more studies, and particularly in the climate change realm, more and more studies are becoming very interdisciplinary where you integrate together social sciences and physical sciences into the same, into the same study. Um, and when you add in the layer of actionable science, where you're directly addressing uh, the needs, the needs of a community, for instance, uh, then it adds another complete layer on top of it. What would be the judgment of merit there? I would still say the same myself, that the importance of the finding you know, and whether in whether or not, in particular, I think that ultimate test of merit is the biggest is the biggest thing there. If it's a claim and a a claim of a physical process is made, and you can see it and predict it accurately in the real world, that I think is probably the biggest thing when it comes to an interdisciplinary related study. But again, that would be a thought, a question to have for the authors and how they would approach that. All right, now we're getting into history. Um, here and some of this I may skip over if only because I have talked about this ad nauseum in other places but there is one point that I want to talk about where you can see here in green um, because it goes to a critique of this article that I have seen online myself Um, and I think um, this has gotten missed (laughs) when it has been um, put this has gotten missed when people have been reading the article or perhaps people didn't read this far. Uh, the universalism of science does not preclude culture and politics from becoming involved in funding priorities. Funders, whether government or private expect to receive a return on their investment. And this is one of the things you do have some intersections here with politics and funding and all those kinds of things. However, politicians should not dictate how science is done and political agendas should not replace returning norms. History demonstrates the dangers of replacing merit-based science with ideological control and social engineering. In the Soviet Union, the aberrations of Tropa and Lysenko had catastrophic consequences for science and society. An agronomist and people's scientist who came from the superior class of poor peasants, Lysenko rejected Mendelian genetics because of its supposed inconsistency with Marxist ideology. Dissent from Lysenko's ideas were, was, um, was outlawed and his opponents were fired and prosecuted. And the other thing that happened, of course, is because there were two countries, not just the USSR, but also Mao Zedong's China, uh, that took in and used Lysenko's very, very, very bad, bad theories. Um, He was very much a pseudoscientist. Uh, Very bad theories. There was a famine that resulted in the deaths of millions upon millions of people um, in the USSR and China. So uh, Trofim Lysenko, I think, holds... (laughs) holds the designation, uh, the disgraceful designation in history of probably being one of the world, being the biggest mass murderer in scientific history. Now, this is a point that I want to get to. Such analysis is often dismissed with vague deflections such as, quote, everything is political and, quote, everyone is biased. There is an element of truth to these declarations which can help raise awareness about the potential of scientists to have biases, including biases on politicized topics, and help minimize such biases. However, those making these arguments often use them to impose their own ideological agendas on what can be studied and what kind of answers are permissible. It is in this sense of the politicization of science that we categorically oppose. Now, just because people have their biases doesn't mean it's a good idea to force those biases or force a particular biased worldview onto an entire discipline. (laughs) That's what the authors are getting at here. And I already hinted at one of the things that I would say with this. Yeah, no kidding. Everybody has their particular bias. Yes. But, and and there's two things here to this. If you're a dedicated truth seeker, you try to be aware of that. And, you know, Try to account for that and, you know, maybe seek a challenge from someone who thinks, seek a challenge to your article from someone who thinks very differently from you. Um, And in the same breath, because of organized skepticism, the Mertonian norm of organized skepticism, yes, 
I may have a bias. But somebody who's critiquing my article may have a bias in the complete opposite direction from me. Completely different way. And probably does. There's such a diversity of thought among scientists, as there should be if you're talking about the pluralism and intellectual diversity, that you can very much mitigate that. <sighs> that you can very much mitigate that, and ultimately, together with the competing of those biases, with the shared goal and hope of getting at what the truth is, you get more towards that. But if you push it to such a degree that you can only do one kind of that you can only approach it from one direction. It is so ideologically poor that you are biasing an entire discipline in one direction, as opposed to having competing biases. Competing biases that, in lots of cases, cancel each other out. Is it perfect? No, of course not. Of course not. But it's a heck of a lot better than having everybody be biased in one direction. And that's why you don't necessarily want to forcibly make disciplines politicized and have it run from one particular worldview or another. This is why pluralism is important here. Alrighty. So, going on the history lesson tour still. Uh, the worst excesses of CSJ ideology are spreading into medicine, psychology, and public health with worldwide implications. So, here what they're getting into is... I'm not going to dwell too much on this. And again, this is, of course, all going to be linked in the description. So I suggest you go read through it. Um, what they're talking about is the notion with decolonization um, here, which <laughs> is just a ridiculous, ridiculous thing. I've talked about it a few times in other videos. It basically amounts to let's just get rid of all Western influence and everything. Um, mm hmm. And so the problem with that is that they have an example here from um, pharmacology. Uh, decolonization in pharmacology involves teaching about drugs developed from folk remedies and focusing on the contributions of non-Europeans. The vast majority of today's pharma pharmacopoeia okay, is derived from the research and development efforts of the modern pharma pharmaceutical industry. Effective treatments derived from traditional medicines are rare, especially in the era of bio- and immunotherapies. For example, of over 150 anti-cancer drugs available today, only three are of natural origin. Um, such pedagogy, decolonization, reinforces mistrust towards white medicine, in quotes, feeding conspiracy theories against the pharmaceutical industry as exemplified by campaigns against COVID vaccines, which sadly disproportionately impacted minority groups. Uh, scientific research requires dedication, intensive technical trainment, training, and commitment to rigor and truth-seeking. Now, as I said before... If you're a scientist with liberal epistemology in mind, you're after the truth. But if your focus is postmodernism, it's about power. It's not about the truth. It doesn't give a damn about what the truth is. Um, and so that's the and that's a point that I wanted to make with that. Um, pretty much is that scientific science, postmodernism, and science and the liberal epistemology are utter opposites and contradiction. They don't work very well together. Um, if the movement in North America to replace merit with ideology and funding and faculty hiring progresses, further deterioration in the ability to foster excellence in research and in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. and is all but inevitable. This does not bode well for the future of science and society globally. Now, the thought that I had that could have made this a bit stronger, and I would have loved to have seen it do it because obviously I'm not seeing folks get in to read the uh, the references. Because the references are long, and yeah, you got a lot of there's a lot of great references in here. But what I would have loved to have seen, actually, as I was reading this, would have been like a table, actually, to give me documented instances of funding calls where you've had this kind of ideological stuff inserted, and how critical was it to actually getting funding? That's something I would have really wanted to see. In the same vein with like the um professional societies. You could do the same thing. How many professional societies have embraced some of this ideology? And what have you. Just a point of note there. Um, enforcing identity-based hiring is discriminatory as it deprives some high-achieving individuals, including economically disadvantaged individuals who are not members of politically favored identity groups, of opportunities they have earned, thereby potentially damaging morale and engagement. 
In the U.S., this has resulted in the unfair treatment of Asian American, Jewish, white, male, and foreign students. Um, yes, and to point to make a point here, if it is ideologically based, if it is identity based hiring, that falls in under violations of the Civil Rights Act. And yes, there's Supreme Court Supreme Court cases in um, in progress, as it were. I think we're still waiting on that decision to come out from the Supreme Court, probably this summer. Um, that has to do with potentially overturning affirmative action. I forget the exact court case, but um, that is up and coming. But um, yeah, there's cases here when you're talking about violations of the Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment in the United States that play into play into gearing here, particularly if it is a government funded university, uh, public university, or if it is per se, shall we uh, shall we say it's probably. I don't know that anybody's tried the case, but I imagine if it's discriminatory in the funding provided um, to a scientist, that would also be a um, fundamental civil rights violation, um, given that the government is paying for most of that. Anyway. <clears throat> Attempts to demonize, inflict reputational damage, or silence critics of social engineering practices by characterizing them as racist, white supremacist, or worse, is particularly detrimental to the open intellectual environment in which scientific inquiry into difficult social problems thrives. For every incident in which a scientist is targeted, thousands get the message and self-censor. Yeah, it's also quite exclusive. Um, I believe it was Clarence Thomas. No, no, it wasn't Clarence Thomas. It was Antonin Scalia. Justice Antonin Scalia quoted a legal, legal phrasing in Latin. <clears throat> uh, inclusio unist est exclusio alterius, which is to say the inclusion of one leads to the exclusion of the others. Um, in this case, you're being so ideologically driven to hire that you are ultimately excluding everybody else. Um, and in the case of science, where you have to have intellectual diversity if you're going to get at the truth, which is the purpose of science, um, yeah, that's a problem. I can't imagine it ending well when you're having scientists who all think the same way about everything and are afraid to possibly think about anything differently. Uh, do, 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 do. Genesis of current attacks on merit-based science. Do, 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 do. The ideological basis of current attacks on science emanates from current certain veins of postmodernism and identity-based ideologies. They have spawned various CSJ theories, including critical race theory, uh, related theories of structural racism and post-colonial theory. Now, these are all legit theories to look at. If you want a good summary of them all, I highly recommend uh, Cynical Theories by uh, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. That is actually a very good uh, breakdown of those particular theories, um, both in terms of their background and how they function and their connections with postmodernist thought and um, some of the ways that they are extremely flawed. So I do recommend that. Um... Uh, they are not imposed by totalitarian regimes, but spread by activists and abetted by university administrators and business leaders who fail to their, protect their institutions from these illiberal, regressive ideas. Yes, I will say illiberal and regressive is correct um, in the terms of the description, despite the fact that, that they have claimed being, um, they made the claim that they are progressive. They are not. I want you to think about that because... What did we do in the 60s? What did this country do in the 60s? Tremendous amounts of stereotyping. And that is unfortunately very similar to what critical social justice or CSJ or CRT, all of those critical theories tend to do, is to just continue that stereotyping. Anyway. <clears throat> Critical theory and CSJ conflict with the liberal enlightenment. According to Delgado and Stefanczyk, their characteristic elements include anti-rationalism, anti-enlightenment, rejection of equal treatment, philosophical liberalism and neutrality in law, standpoint epistemology and subjectivism as the basis of knowledge, and intersectionality. Recently, ideas that emerge from critical theory have been aggressively disseminated to the public, notably in books by D'Angelo and Kendi, Robin D'Angelo and Ibram X. Kendi, for that matter. Um... This is a great table, um, and one again, once again, this is one of those things where I would very much encourage teaching this to students, making sure they understand the difference <laughs> and what here. So, um, 
And again, a lot of these I'm not going to dwell too much on right here, but this is also talked about in cynical theories. So I very much recommend reading that. Um, do, 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 do. But some of the key differences here to take into account. Liberal epistemology, you have objective reality. Anybody can be proven wrong. Um, anyone can always be wrong. Excuse me. A rejection of any theory that cannot be proven or disproven right by reality. Rejection of any theory that you know, can be falsified. Uh, well, yeah, not, not that it can be falsified, but is falsified based on evidence. There we go. Accountability, the openness to conceding and correcting errors and pluralism, pluralism, the maintenance of intellectual diversity to maximize the chance of finding the truth. Uh, CSJ, postmodernists generally deny the existence of objective reality, replace the concept of truth with multiple narratives and alternative ways of knowing, States that claims to the truth are merely claims to power. It is always about power with postmodernists. Considers that lived experience and subjectivism are th as the basis of knowledge. And again, as a reminder, I hate the phrase lived experience. It's, it's a stupid, it's a stupid, redundant phrase. An experience by definition is something you've lived through. Rejects the theory that it can be proven or disproven by an empirical process. Denies the legitimacy of other viewpoints does not admit corrections from the outside. It's a very closed system. Very cult-like, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so, um, CSJ is not an empirical theory because its tenets are maintained despite either being demonstra demonstrably false or unfalsifiable. For example, many times I've talked about on this channel that you often have a situation where you have a dogmatic belief, um, if you were, that, well, if you saw the little short explainer video, you kind of know what I'm going to say with this. In critical race theory, for an example, they presume that racism is pervasive in everything. And so they look for it in every bloody little thing. Um, and for this reason, what you often get is the logical fallacy that comes from, <laughs> that comes from the critical theorists that every disparity is resulting from discrimination and allow me to present a different example if i can pull it up where is it uh yeah here it is um you've seen me talk about this before this is a new thing by the way this is funded by the nsf national science foundation quantitative critical theory um uh, comes from critical race theory um here here is the tenet of quant crit to know the centrality of oppression Quant crit researchers take as a fact that structural racism and sexism plague the U.S. economic, political, and educational systems. Gaps in student performance result from system-wide policies and approaches that implicitly and explicitly disadvantage broad groups of students, particularly those that do not identify as white men. Oh boy. Uh, students are oppressed for a myriad of dimensions of diversity beyond gender and race, including ableness, religious affiliation, and socioeconomic status. Quant crit researchers commit to disrupting narratives that frame minoritized students as deficient and disrupting oppressive systems through anti-racist and anti-sexist works. Work, which this is a group of scientists that are engaged in analytical analysis, but they automatically start from the premise that, yeah, whatever disparity we find is because of discrimination or structural disc structural uh, structural uh, discrimination or systemic discrimination, however you wish to put it. So that's just to make to make the point here <laughs> um, here that they will take that as dogma. And unfortunately, it is actually funded by NSF. Uh, the fallibility of lived experience is attested to by wealth by a wealth of psychological research demonstrating errors and biases in self-reports, yet CSJ has found its way into STEM, evoking parallels with the ideological corruption of science of past totalitarian regimes. Now, the fallibility of lived experience is one thing, but there's a point I wanted to make here that not necessarily to the authors, but it is another point in this and why lived experience doesn't necessarily mean much, particularly when it comes from anecdotal kind of things and what have you here is that two people can have exactly the same experience but make completely different meaning of it why is that the case two people can have the same experience and say oh this is a symptom of systemic racism oh it's just some asshole being a jerk why people are very different in their individual brains and how they think about things <laughs> That's one of the reasons that lived experience isn't great either, because you end up with two very, very different meanings 
that people attain to it. Uh, the good example in here, I think, was a Heterodox Academy article uh, on the blog that pointed out the difference between Justice um, Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas, and the late Justice Thurgood Marshall. Two men had very experiences in their lives. Both of them ended up being Supreme Court justices. Thurgood Marshall was much more egalitarian in his approach to solving the same problems that he and Clarence Thomas both saw. Why did they end up being so different if they had very, very similar uh, experiences in their lives? It's a point to think about. Um, often here, I'm not going to go for too much of this, but a lot of this is just to point out that a lot of this kind of notion where you see it being stated that um, apologizes for systemic racism, systemic racism in higher education, all this kind of thing, that's taken as an article of faith, which goes back to the thing I was saying with the quant crit stuff. Um, such publications rarely, if ever, provide evidence that observed disproportionalities in race or gender distribution of a scientific field are the result of present-day structural or systemic racism, whereas historical events such as apartheid, slavery, and Jim Crow are beyond dispute. The extent to which systemic racism influences STEM or academia today is a contested question. Its existence cannot be established by proclamation. In the absence of compelling evidence, these assertions are not scientific, they are dogma. Um, mm-hmm. In his book, Discrimination and Disparities, Thomas Sowell takes to task the central axiom of CSJ that disparate outcomes for various social groups emerge as a result of discrimination, and it presents ample evidence illustrating its fallacy. Sowell's arguments present compelling counterparts to the standard of the standard set of arguments against meritocracy, such as those presented in The Tyranny of Merit and The Meritocracy Trap. Um, so... Here are some of the things that I want to point out here um, with this green section. Space considerations do not permit a full evaluation of the arguments, many of which boil down to merit systems being imperfect, that is. There are biases and judgments of merit that they are not always implemented as promised and that they, create, or that they risk creating hubris in the successful and despair amongst the unsuccessful. Our perspective is that, however, valid these criticisms, merit-based systems are still immensely superior to alternatives that have either been tried before or are being proposed now. Communist systems, for example, which are vastly more egalitarian, produced misery on an unimaginable scale. Mm -hmm. Point that I would say for the authors is, yeah, you didn't definitely didn't have space to do it in this article. Um, bring it up for another paper. You know? Collate, collate the arguments against merit um, as you kind of started doing there and do it in another paper because I guarantee you that's going to come back now. <laughs> if it hasn't already been brought up, it's going to be back now. So why not just go for it and do it in a second paper? <laughs> All right. This is the second to last section. As I said, this article is extremely long, um, but it is extremely thorough. So I very much suggest that you, uh, you come back here to talk about this. And I am trying to add some things here. So exhibits on the intrusion of ideology into science and attacks on merit. In recent years, numerous statements issued by scientific societies and papers published in Science and Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, and other respected journals have been advancing CSJ ideology and attacking science and liberal epistemology, which think on that statement for a minute. <laughs> think on that statement for a minute, because the, those that are just cited here are the premier, are the best. It's considered one of the highest honors for publications to get published in science and nature. And now these things are turning around and attacking the very, the very thing that they are supposed to be the premier of. Now think about how depressing that is, actually. Below we highlight selected examples of such publications um, grouped according to recurring themes. Common among them is revolutionary deconstructivism, which calls for the established structures and practices of science to re be replaced by CSJ practices. Words like excellence, impact, or quality rarely appear or appear only to be problematized, which according to CSJ can be done to anything, 
Instead, we see ample mention of white supremacy, discrimination, harassment, race, gender, violence, intersectionality, and violence, I'm going to take a wager, probably doesn't mean actually like physically you know, hitting, harming somebody, but just being offended. Um, intersectionality and marginalization, typically without citation to supporting evidence, an egregious failure for journals purporting to be about science. These pieces fail to acknowledge the progress that has been made and continues to be made toward equality, fairness, and justice throughout the Western world. Instead, they attribute, generally without evidence, the underrepresentation of any group in any domain to systemic racism in the present or with, and within the domain itself. This precludes an honest appraisal of the root causes of disparities and is likely to lead, therefore, to solutions that are ineffective, unjust, and damaging to science. Objective reality is a very real thing in the physical world that we can see around us. So, at least that's what I take in the liberal epistemology, putting aside the postmodernist for a second. Um, so if you're doing something that is not based in objective reality, making an argument that it is itself not based in objective reality and acknowledging actual progress that has been made and just attributing based upon you think and you feel, it's likely to end pretty badly. Let's see. The scientific community must come to the realization that such articles are not innocent expressions of well-meaning individuals. They are not exaggerations or outliers, but are true to the creed of the ideology that produced them. The sheer volume of these publications illustrate the extent of the ideological intrusion into science. Okay, I'm going to take a pause right there because I wanted to help this uh, help make the point here that the authors are trying to make um, with this. So I did. Oh shoot, you can't see it. Hold on a second. Do 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 do. Hold that thought. One moment. There we go. One moment. I just had to do a quick correction. Um, here of the actual um, thing here. So I ran a, um, a Google Scholar search, a couple of different ones. Um, and you can see here, I d denoted it as being uh, since 2019 in particular with this. So <clears throat> what I Googled was systemic racism and in quotes, STEM, to get at the point here. These are all articles that Google Scholar could find from 2019. Now, admittedly, admittedly, one thing that goes on with this, of course, is you're going to scoop up some things that are not pro some of the ideology here. But look at the number right here. This is since 2019, 17, about 17,500 results. Um, and you can see it going down here. And of course, this goes... This goes off and down here. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, educational researcher, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Canadian Journal of Science, Mathematics, and something, I don't know what the end one is. Uh, Journal of Science Teacher Education, do, 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 Educational Psychology Review, uh, Education, Science, right here, Systemic Racism in Higher Education. Um, addressing Systemic Racism as the Cancer of Black People, Good Grief, Nature Reviews Cancer. Um, let me go look to another page here. Uh, do, 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 continued STEM commitment, racism, sexism, and disconnection, uh, stemming the tide. Oh, <laughs> there you go, right here. Uh huh. So, 17,500, um, just since 2019, in terms of what Google Scholar could find. Um, similarly, this one here is not, uh, systemic racism STEM. This is decolonizing STEM as it were, <laughs> yeah. again, also since 2019, um, undressing, uh, undressing, wow, pardon that typo, uh, addressing unconscious coloniality and decolonizing practice in ge geoscience, nature reviews, earth and environment, 2021, decolonizing the undergraduate chemistry curriculum and account of how to start. I actually reviewed that article and I will say one thing about, about the decolonization, colonization thing when we get there momentarily. Uh, multi-drug, decolonizing curriculum and pedagogy. Continue for a moment. Uh, decolonizing through STEAM, arts as a social justice in a STEM paradigm. Uh, STEM and public ed education in Quebec. Uh, indigenous STEM stories as decolonizing, disquieting colon decolonization. You get the picture. It goes on. What do we have here? 16,800. 
since 2019, according to Google Scholar. So before you think it's a one-off, nope, <laughs> ain't a one-off. Hate to break it. It's not a one-off. That's for dang sure. So, <clears throat> let us continue here a moment. <clears throat> so, they get into several themes that go on here. I'm not going to try and go through all of this, um, just because I will be here all night. <laughs> but also, um, <sighs> but also, um, this will leave you some, some things to read also, I think. For decades, critical theories had been confined to humanities and studies departments of universities, but the ideas have spread to other disciplines and the outside world, where they have been picked up by activists and the press. The Apex Journal has created a decolonizing science toolkit, which includes articles such as Institutions Must Acknowledge the Racist Roots in Science, Decolonization should extend to collaborations, authorization, authorship, and co-creation of knowledge, and seeding anti-racist culture at Scotland's botanical gardens. Um, so, this is a note on decolonization. Decolonization, quote, is a movement to eliminate the disproportionate legacy of white European thought and culture in education, dismantling the hegemony of European values, and making way for local philosophy and traditions that colonists had cast aside. Um, it discusses the value of greater local involvement in science. Um, okay, one might think the article would identify how, for example, Newtonian physics and, or Darwin's biology went wrong and the errors were fixed by indigenous knowledge. It does nothing of the kind. Instead, it discusses the value of greater local involvement in science and having science education address local needs and interests. These laudable goals, which we hope succeed, have nothing to do with the hegemony of European values. Indeed, the article acknowledges that the meaning of decolonization is not well-defined. We doubt it can be, because it is ideological rhetoric, rather than scientific statement with truth value. Okay. <clears throat> so, one of the points I wanted to make, actually, on the decolonization side, um, that they didn't get into here, is that in the article that I critiqued on the decolonization of the chemistry curriculum... Um, back in the history of this channel, you can definitely find it. Um, I made a point of saying it. I said it many, many, many times that there is no proof that it works. There is no evidence that it works. And it was a fair critique, I think, to point out that, well, yeah, we're just now trying it. Of course, we don't have proof that it works. You don't have evidence that things change. But proof has two meanings. You can also have the logical proof that it works. And I have yet to see an article that actually demonstrates in a logical proof that decolonization would work at all as however they describe it. And I don't think they can because it is definitely not well defined beyond just saying, Oh, we're just going to try and get rid of anything that's Western. No proof that that's necessarily going to help anything uh, logical or evidence wise, but anyway, <clears throat> papers calling for the decolonization of practically every domain in STEM are mushrooming in the literature with little opposition. Um, a rare exception critiques the notions of decolonizing global health. The authors articulate the harms of decolonization agenda, namely undermines... Okay, this is the one case, one case where um, somebody was actually critiquing the so-called colonization thing. So, uh, the second thing here is about science being deemed racist. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to have a, I'm, I have a video clip to show on that when I get down to this green section. But anyway, um, race has become a central political and social issue in the U.S. and belong beyond rather than that. Learned society, learned societies and institutions, including the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health have issued statements asserting without evidence the existence of systemic racism among their ranks and pledging to combat it. The American Physical Society, the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, the Society for the Study of Evolution, and the National Association of Geoscience Teachers and their sister societies outside of the United States have published similar statements. I'll give you one better. Uh, the American Geophysical Union is pushing something as such, pushing the URGE program on its uh, scientists, young scientists uh, alike across the United States, uh, URGE being unlearning racism in geosciences. Again, without evidence. 
I have looked at some of the materials for the urge program and it's actually pretty egregious. Um, <clears throat> It's a topic in another video. I believe I've already done that. But anyway, uh, numerous university science departments have followed suit in the journal Science. Chemist Holden, chemist Holden Thorpe claimed, ironically without evidence, that, quote, evidence of systemic racism in science pervades this nation, the United States. In an unsigned editorial, Nature's editor stated that, quote, scientific institutions were and remain complicit in systemic racism and pledged to, quote, end anti-black practices in research. American Chemical Society published an editorial signed by all senior editors alleging the existence of systemic racism in chemistry publishing. Among several action points, they pledged to include diversity of journal contributors as an explicit measurement of editor-in-chief performance. That's not good. Um, a Nature editorial in 2021 reaffirms the narrative. Racism in science is endemic because the systems that produce and teach scientific knowledge have marginalized and ill-treated people of other skin colors and underrepresented groups for centuries. Organizations must ensure that anti-racism is embedded in their objectives and that such work wins recognition and promotion. And too often, conventional metrics, citations, publications, and profits, citation, citations, publications, and profits reward those in positions of power rather than helping to shift the balance of power. Again, it's all about power and it's all about the belief get rather than the actual truth. It's the dogmatic belief here that they are pointing to, and that is pretty common to postmodernist thought in here, that if there is a disparity, discrimination exists. And I've recovered this in Nature articles, for Pete's sake. Um, let's see. This is actually what I want to get into. The recurring... Th in 2022, Science published a special issue, The Missing Physicists, how, physicists, how Physics Excludes Black Researchers, featuring an editorial dismantle racism in science and several pieces with titles such as Can U.S. Physics Overcome Its Record of Exclusion? The Toll of White Privilege and Fix the System, Not the Students. The recurring themes are that physics is racist and exclusionary, run by a white priesthood, quote, and based on, quote, white privilege, that existing programs do not serve women or minorities who purportedly need a different educational approach, and that merit-based evaluations must be relaxed to increase diversity in science, and this will benefit the field. Now, I want to come over here. Um, so Glenn Lowry had on uh, Sylvester Gates, um, who is a fantastic physicist himself, to actually talk about this very issue. And um, though Glenn himself is an, is an author of this study, um, the, the physicist here, Sylvester Gates, is not, I believe, listed on here. One moment. He is not. So we will let him say it in his own words and let him provide that discussion for a moment. But do you think there's a, I mean, so Shockley was Shockley. He was an individual person who had the views that he had, just like Watson had the views that he had and whatever. Of course. Shockley, who they're talking about here, was also a physicist. Um, was also a physicist, but the man was pretty much an asshole otherwise. And he was, he basically had the gall to say at some point that he didn't think certain groups of people could do physics. Let's put it that way. Of course. Do you think there's something systematic or systemic affecting the discipline of physics, which was reflected in the fact of Shockley in the case at hand saying what he said? Well, my answer is no, but I, this is not universally agreed upon even by people of the African diaspora. There are people who will tell you, people of color, that um, science and then physics is, Im is embedded in the way that Europeans think and uh, the kind of viewpoints that they have, that the science is fatally flawed because it's embedded in that. And so what I'd like to point out is several things. Yes. It is true that physics in particular is a construction of European males. It starts with Sir Isaac Newton, and it blossoms throughout the last several centuries and is the basis of our of uh, bountiful living as humans today. That's a fact. However, when you look at physics, it's also a body of, of thought and observations and knowledge and in that body of knowledge, as far as I have experienced over the last 15 years, I do not see how racism is embedded in the body of this work. Now, a lot of people will disagree with me 
And I and I'd like to say, well, let's look at uh, basketball. Give me the names of the African American athletes who started basketball, who invented basketball. And you're grinning because you know the answer is that was basketball was invented by a gentleman by the name of James Naismith, who was a European ethnic male, right? And that doesn't stop African Americans to moving to the forefront and achieving at the highest level. So why should I believe because something is invented by a particular person or group of people that that prevents other groups of human beings from excelling and reaching the very outer rims of excellence in those areas? So that was the point um, that I wanted to make with this section. And um, Sylvester Gates makes the point much better than I could, even in that the notion that people need special treatment or just because it came from Europe and some of the thoughts and ways of approaches came from Europe, that people can't succeed in that because of that is bull. (laughs) It's bull on its face. Um, And, you know, not everybody thinks the same way either or has the same experience. Um, One hot second here. It's getting bloody cold, so I just wanted to close the window here for a minute. (laughs) So that's the point to make there. Um, As is typical, when viewed through the lens of critical theory, these assertions were not buttressed by actual evidence of systemic racism. The extent of the existence of quantitative disparities was the only evidence required. This is actually a very common logical fallacy that I see amongst these things. But from the scientific from a scientific perspective, assertions require evidence and correlation does not imply causation. In fact, the assertion that all inequality in the present is determined by discrimination in the present is readily refuted by evidence. For example, Asian Americans earn more advanced degrees and have higher incomes than do white Americans. The notion that all inequality reflects systemic racism leads to the absurd conclusion that the U.S. is an Asian supremacist country. More, many more examples of this kind can be found in discrimination and disparities. So yeah, Thomas Sowell was way ahead of his time <laughs> um, seeing this particular problem and writing it up in the book there. So this has to do with uh, historical cases um, here. And yeah, you can have individuals being nasty, but an individual anecdotal cases does not indict a whole discipline as being something evil. Um, if you will, the proposed solutions to a problem that has been shown that has not been shown to exist endanger the integrity of the scientific enterprise. Scientific positions, grants, and article and article acceptances should be awarded on the basis of their quality rather than treated as commodities to be distributed based on identity categories. The telos of science is the search for provisional truth, truth and the production of knowledge not the redistribution of rewards to achieve activist visions of equity or reparative justice. So the examples here are just examples from medicine um, here. So this is, has to do with the anti-racism agenda for medicine with COVID-19, the American Medical Association. This is one for the American Psychological Association, um, which makes a lengthy apology to people of color for asso- the association's supposed role in promoting, perpetuating, and failing to challenge racism, racial discrimination, and human hierarchy in the U.S. They promote a radical, non-evidence-based, untested psychotherapy that encourages patients to see their problems through a lens of power and race. Again, nothing about the truth. Uh, A recommendation flagrantly abandoning known best practices such as centering therapy on the concerns of the patient rather than those of the therapist and cognitive behavioral therapy. This is not science. in It is ideology and arguably malpractice. So that's two um, here. And they had three. <clears throat> they have three in this. And the third one has to do, you know, should absolutely replace merit-based stuff with um, identity policies um, in here. So many scientific fields are now under pressure to rethink how research is conducted. The forms of pressure range from injunctions to increase the diversity of researchers to calls to eliminate merit-based metrics of the performance of students, postdocs, and faculty. The existing standards are purported to be white, colonial, and sexist, and insufficiently inclusive. Traditional success and impact metrics, citations and impact factors, are claimed to be flawed and biased against already marginalized groups and to perpetuate sexist and racist rewards. Now, 
existing standards, many things in science purported to be white colonial. Allow me to remind something here. Um, Natural, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. This was their bloody graphic. Got them in all sorts of hot water, so despite the fact this, the the um, things here. So all of this is considered by that museum, put forward by that museum, to be aspects of whiteness or white culture. No, no. Just to be bloody clear on this, National Museum of African American History and Culture put this out in 2020. Um, here, white dominant culture or whiteness refers to ways white people and their traditions, attitudes, and ways of life have been normalized over time and are now considered the standard practices in the United States. And since white people still hold most of the institutional power in America, we have all some internalized some aspects of white culture, including people of color. So, in other words, if you're valuing these things, you're perpetuating whiteness. Does nobody see, how to see the problem of this in terms of the stereotyping they're actually doing? This is why it's regressive ideology. It goes right back to the 50s and 60s. It's not progressive. It's regressive. But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> major scientific journals such as Nature... So okay. In response, scientific institutions have begun implementing identity-based practices and social engineering. Some hiring committees are prioritizing diversity over merit or even using an ideology as a filter by, for example, eliminating candidates solely based on DEI statements. I have gone into depth with DEI statements here in the past, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much here, but if you've been following along long enough, you know what I think of DEI statements. They are ideological litmus tests. They are not appropriate with respect to scientific work at all. The National Academies of Sciences now penalizes its nominating committees if their nominations are insufficiently diverse. The secretary of the NAS revealed how this will operate. We assign slots to different fields based on the diversity of the list of nominees that get forwarded. And if their slots, if they use their slots to pick a bunch of white guys from Harvard, they get penalized. In other words, they're putting demographics over whether or not the candidates are actually are notable. Demographics are not what should matter in this case. Um, if we continue to subjugate meritocracy to CSJ, critical social justice again as a reminder, by failing to reward the best performing individuals and recognize the most creative and influential work, we risk eroding scientific excellence. When the NAS signals, quote, this is the way we provide scientific rewards, other scientific institutions will follow their lead. And this is why that's important what the NAS is doing. Now, this last part I have in here is highlighted um, for a particular reason. Race and gender-based selections for honors, conference presentations, and awards undermines the achievements of individuals from underrepresented groups by creating an impression that women and minorities cannot compete in an open marketplace of ideas and talent. It is also offensive to know that one's research was selected not strictly for its merit, but at least partly due to one's ethnicity or gender. This is the soft bigotry of low expectations, the creation of different standards based on perceived or real historical oppression, oppression of some individuals. Now, I highlighted this, and I have a note here of um, personal experience. Um, I have had this problem myself in my own professional capacity. Um, not just necessarily the notion where it seems like, you know, it seems like I'm being honored or given an honor not for the achievement. And admittedly, the way things are currently, it is very hard to tell <laughs> with some institutions whether something is being given honestly or it's just a cop out to meet a diversity criteria i gotta be honest about that in terms of what it seems like to me again i perfectly acknowledge this is entirely anecdotal so i have no no other basis than that to go there and so that's that's i have to mention that and caveat that intensely for that reason um, but I will also add one thing here that is not acknowledged. I have said it many times that much of this postmodernist ideology is regressive in that it is based upon stereotyping people, um, based upon, you know, race, sex, gender, what have you. Um, and one of the things that has a result of this is that, um, well, like there are many times, uh, that, uh, 
there's the assumption of, oh, you know how it is as a woman, as a woman in science. No, actually, I don't. Do you know why? Just because I am a scientist who happens to be a woman, not a woman who happens to be a scientist, a scientist who happens to be a woman, doesn't mean I have the same bloody experiences that any other woman does in academia. I have not. And I had to think about it very carefully. Never did I have to deal with sexism professionally until a lot of this postmodernist ideology came around. Think on that one. That's my kind of personal experience with it. And I have to, again, caveat extremely strongly that it is my own experience here that is not uh, necessarily representative of others. I will let others speak for themselves. But it is a notion to keep in mind in here that um, it's not exactly great to have certain amounts of stereotyping be brought on. A very regressive style being masked in a progressive note. They go on here to discuss uh, the issues with affirmative action and how that's flawed um, in here also. And But I wanted to get to another um, another more critical factor here. Um, let's see. CRT informed social engineering is now present in every domain of science, including publishing, hiring, and research funding. Some journals have been begun urging authors to preferentially cite articles led by colleagues from different gender identities and geographical areas in spirit of citation justice. Promoters, uh, promoters of citation justice justify the practice by the assumption that differences in citation race are sexist or sex, uh, racist or sexist biases in publishing. Again, disparity fallacy. Uh, this, however, is an unsubstantiated claim as we discussed below. Um... So they go on in here to say that um, claims of bias, um, in particular article that is highly cited, um, are unfounded in this case. Um, but when you start to control for various factors, in fact, matter, this is probably the article that I should before um, this one <laughs> right here that they're referring to, where you actually see a lot of these, a lot of those gaps collapse. Um, there is no evidence that introducing identity-based based biases to peer review process will do anything to improve science. Adding a citational representation to redress grievances makes sense only if one views citations as rewards to be distributed rather than acknowledgments of scientific contributions. Although the current peer review system is not perfect and is sometimes affected by personal biases, these imperfections do not justify adding non-scientific considera considerations to the review process. Uh, bias should be eliminated by procedure procedures that cleave to truth and rigorous evidence, not by reversing the direction of biases or adding irrelevant noise, intentionally adding biases and imperfections erodes the integrity of the literature. So there is that in there. Um, actually this green note here is actually what I wish they had brought up sooner. Um, in a similar vein, institutions justify mandatory DEI training by alleged implicit biases based mostly in the implicit association test, which is riddled with conceptual, theoretical, empirical, statistical, and methodological limitations, weaknesses, and artifacts. Indeed, there is no evidence that receiving implicit bias training or reducing implicit bias as measured by the IAT reduces discriminatory, discriminatory behavior. Um, because the uh, implicit bias thing is one of the reasons against, uh, one of the critics' arguments to say, no, you can't have merit. It's because you've got your biases in those subjective judgments. Well... There's not really any proof that your other things with all this other stuff is actually going to make it any better. And like I said, what if you have competing biases involved here and they cancel each other out? Rarely, if ever, are these kinds of decisions in, you know, funding, hiring, what have you, ever made by just one person. <clears throat> Putting aside separate objections that the use of DEI statements to screen applicants constitutes a political litmus test and a form of possibly illegal compelled speech. By reducing the viable applicant pool, it likely undermines the quality of science. A brilliant mathematician or physicist or cognitive scientist may be filtered out by virtue of having expressed insufficient enthusiasm or familiarity with a particular version of DEI that, that the institution supports. 
So that goes back to DEI statements again. There's other things here, but this is actually the more critical note that I wanted to stop into here before we get into the closing sections here for this long bloody review. Um, in research funding, some grant programs now require that applications include an explanation of how proposed how the proposed project will address the principles of DEI. Again, I would love to see this tabled out. Show me who's doing it. Show me who's doing it. Put in a table. What do they call it? You know, because of course the names change and all this other kind of stuff. Like what is it? Like, like the inclusion plan or something like that in, in one grant thing I saw recently. Um, failure to adequately address DEI bears the risk of rejection. Should government funding advance science, fundamental research, energy solutions, health and medicine, or social engineering? Uh, McHorter notes, the notion seems to be that practitioners and scholars across disciplines must devote a considerable part of their time to putatively anti-racist initiatives. It's a bold proposition, but given how shaky its actual justification is, it is reasonable to think that lately this devotion is being imposed by fiat as opposed to being an organic outpouring. And if the price for questioning that notion is to be seen as sitting somewhere on a spectrum ranging from retrogressive to racist, it's a price few are willing to pay. One is rather to pretend. And this is actually a note that I wanted to make um, because who does this screw over the most um, in this particular case? And it is often, I would say, in this case, the young scientists who are themselves just fresh off of their PhD and going after grants for the first time themselves and now have to incorporate this if they even want to get that initial bit of funding to prove that they are, you know, have a mer meritorious claim, get that initial bit of funding, get their whole program up and running and whatever they may run, and on, run on and develop themselves as scientists. This is what screws them over for that. Because you have to incorporate something that is not, incorporate something that is not really connected to the scientific merits of what you're doing in order to get funded. Some of the more established scientists can, you know, for very different reasons, for very, 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 very many reasons, perhaps get around it. You've got an establishment, you can go after grants in different places, you can do this, you can do that. It's not necessarily so for a young, early career scientist, I don't think. So it's a point to make with that. Um... <clears throat> More than 200 institutions from around the globe have signed the ALBA Declaration on Equity and Inclusion, which asserts that bias against women and minorities in STEM is ubiquitous and calls for social engineering. Didn't we just show an article about that? Anyway. All right, we are finally at the close. It's <laughs> the last section before the actual conclusions of the article, so hopefully we will get to, uh, here to the end shortly. This is going to be a long review. Thank you for sticking through it. Uh, for science to succeed, it must strive for the non-ideological pursuit of objective truth. Scientists should feel free to pursue their political pub projects in the public sphere as private citizens, but not to inject their personal politics and biases into the scientific endeavor. Maintaining institutional neutrality is also essential for cultivating public trust in science. Don't forget that nature basically shot themselves in the foot by endorsing President Biden when he was candidate Biden in 2020. And then decided they're going to double down and do it anyway, if you saw that nature editorial. They'd do it again anyway. The rush to create systems institutionalizing racial, ethnic, and gender preferences in college admissions and hiring will further corrode public trust in academia and science. Surveys from the U.S. show that most Americans, including most Americans of color, reject such preferences. Although no system is guaranteed to eliminate all biases, merit-based systems are the best tool to mitigate it. Moreover, they promote social cohesion, cohesion because they can be observed to maximize fairness. Admittedly, meritocracy is not it, it is imperfect. The best and brightest do not always win. But the idea, idea that meritocracy is nothing but a miss is demonstrably false and indeed absurd. Word a myth, college admissions and hiring could be conducted without regard to applicant qualifications, and students or employees could be selected at random. The role of science in rectifying social inequalities goes beyond trickle-down effects of scientific progress. Science can help develop programs addressing both the root causes of inequalities and the effectiveness of remedial policies. Recent works by Vangeri and Duflo illustrate how well-founded scientific methodology can narrow the gap between rich and poor countries. There you go. The one example right there. They've got a bunch of these examples. We won't get too much into it. There is a large literature in the field of psychology on the role that demographic biases play in how we judge individuals. 
Such biases are real and a justified concern, but fighting them with opposite biases and undermining merit is counterproductive. Two of the most robust findings in the literature are, one, people massively judge others on their merits when their merits are clear and salient. And two, in such situations, stereotypes and implicit biases are minimized. Well-known literature from psychology. How do we begin the process of depoliticizing science and strengthening merit-based practices? We offer six concrete suggestions. Insist that government funding for research be distributed solely on the basis of merit. Ensure that academic departments and conferences select speakers based on scientific rather than ideological considerations. Ensure that admissions, hiring, and promotions are merit-based and free from ideological tests. No DEI statements, in other words. Publish and retract scientific papers on the basis of scientific, not ideological arguments or due to public pressure. Require that universities enforce policies protecting academic freedom and freedom of expression according to best practices promulgated by nonpartisan free speech and academic freedom organizations, such as the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Insist that university departments and professional societies refrain from issuing statements on social and political issues not relevant to their functioning as recommended by in the University of Chicago's Calvin Report. Now, there's one thing I want to add, actually, because as I said, it has been ignored many times over, and the one thing is if, if it isn't addressed, it doesn't necessarily matter what these six things are, in that the things that you have talked about with merit, with the scientific norms, with basic philosophy of science, with popper and falsification and the constitution knowledge and what have you needs to be taught to undergraduate STEM students to graduate STEM students at a very minimum. If you can't do undergrads because none of it is taught. As I said before myself, I didn't learn anything about those philosophical concepts myself, except for maybe in practice and an implicit practice when I was working on my graduate degrees until I got out of grad school and was a PhD on my own. I went and did the reading on my own with that. That is that is a shameful dereliction of duty that we are not teaching those concepts to our students in college when they are the next generation of STEM scientists. And a lot of this isn't going to matter if the ideology that now is trying to fill the gap um, in here doesn't come in, uh, doesn't get a challenge at least from those particular norms actually being taught. And yeah, you can talk, I mean, do the class too. If you want to do the class about, you know, some of the things, the critique of the norms and all that kind of stuff, that'd be actually fun. Um, but please at least teach them. <laughs> Make it a required course for STEM students. Um, that would be helpful right now. Although much has been written about DEI, the ad arguments advocating it fall into familiar categories. Reparative justice is needed to redress historical discrimination. DEI is necessary to fight current discrimination, and DEI is needed to level the playing field and achieve equal outcomes. Now, one critique I have to make in hindsight reading this paper is they didn't connect DEI and so critical social justice stuff very well. And I will make that connection for you in that much of the DEI stuff that is done today is based upon the philosophies of critical social justice and postmodernist thought. It is not based on liberal epistemology. Note to self. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Outreach and in admissions and hiring candidates from less advantaged backgrounds is important not only to promote fairness, but also to enlarge the pool of promising candidates. Schools and universities have a role to play in leveling the playing field by uplifting students who have come from more difficult life circumstances, not by imposing quotas or lowering academic standards, but by providing students with opportunities to develop the rigorous skills they need to enter the scientific field and the support to do so. In this way, merit and diversity become synergistic rather than antagonistic. Advocates of the critical social justice approaches to DEI often present the options. Yeah, now they've made the connection. Needed to make that connection sooner. That was definitely a failing of the article here. Um, often present the options as if it is either CSJ or bigotry. We reflect, we reject this false dichotomy. Dismantling or disrupting institutional practices that have been, that have produced science's achievements and replacing them with untested methods opposed to the Meritonian norms is a dangerous experiment that jeopardizes the future of science. Well said. I could not agree more with that statement closing. Imbuing science with ideology harms the scientific enterprise and leads to a loss of public trust. 
If we continue to undermine merit, our universities will become institutions of mediocrity rather than places of creativity and accomplishment, leading to the loss of competitive edge in technology. Thus, we need to restore our commitment to practices grounded in epistemic humility and the meritocratic liberal tradition. Scientists must start standing up for integrity in their fields, despite the risk of bullying and verbal attacks. Donors and funders should condition their support on nonpartisan and rational scientific pursuit. Science is a free pursuit of knowledge, untainted by ideological orthodoxies, maximizes the, maximally enhances the public good. Whoop! Like I said, this article is long, but there was so much good stuff in it that I wanted to go through as much of it as I could with you um, in here. So congratulations if you made it all the way to the end. I am still not entirely done because there is one note that needs to be addressed here. If you were privy on the last side chat Saturday, um, I covered the abysmal decision by the American Physical Society to refuse to publish a rebuttal to an article an article entitled um, Observing Whiteness in Introductory Physics. When that original article came out, it was roundly mocked. It was a horrifically bad article. I read it. I was one of the people who mocked it. I also noted the critique and response of the American Physical Society's editorial board, the editorial board for that specific journal, saying, yeah, comments are welcome, but, you know, derision and hatred is not. Which, I mean, fair enough. They offered, they invited comments, and then they refused to publish the comment. <laughs> the rebuttal comment. This, unfortunately, this article itself was published in a relatively new journal, the Journal of Controversial Ideas. The idea of defending merit in science, and really the article itself, I would say, actually offers a defense of science itself um, from a postmodernist thought. I might say that. Um, this is the interesting state. Perhaps the grandest irony of them all and the saddest commentary on the state of academia is that this article, Defending Merit, could only be published in a journal airing, devoted to airing controversial ideas. As we were finalizing the manuscript for publication, the Office of Science and Technology of the White House released a 14-page long vision statement outlining priorities for U.S. STEM ecosystem. The word merit appeared nowhere in the document. In February 2023, the National Academy of Sciences released a report titled Advancing Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in STEM Organizations Beyond Broadening Participation. The report describes merit as a non-objective, culturally construed concept used to hide bias and perpetuate privilege and refers to objectivity and meritocracy in STEM as myths and calls for merit-based metrics to be eva of evaluation to be dismantled. Bad idea, to be honest. Bad idea. Like I said, the, like they said in here, the ultimate test with merit is whether or not you can accurately predict something that happens in the real world. But let me go down here to this note of 147, um, because this is a tag from the authors in particular. We first approached a prominent interdisciplinary science journal with our manuscript, which we thought would be appropriate venue for our commentary because it had published several perspectives on the topic from the CSJ point of view. Hang on, let me flow this up a little. Um, <clears throat> we were given approval to submit our manuscript as a perspective, but advised to remove the word merit from the title by the editorial board who wrote, quote, most readers will immediately associate the term merit with ongoing debate about merit in college admissions and the whole concept of meritocracy in education. The problem is that this concept of merit, as the authors surely know, has been widely and legitimately attacked as hollow. If the authors could use a different term, I would encourage that emphasis ours. Thus, not only is meritocracy in science a controversial idea in some circles, the very existence of merit as a concept is questioned. So it appeared right from the start that publishing our manuscript was going to be an uphill battle. Indeed, our paper was reviewed and rejected largely on ideological grounds, citing, among other reasons, its hurtfulness. We then approached several other, several other scientific journals with informal inquiries about the suitability of our manuscript for publication, and the outcome was not encouraging. Therefore, the paper was submitted to the Journal of Controversial Ideas, where we will believe it will add a balance of view, add balance to viewpoints appearing in academic journals on this important topic. 
you can't publish something that has a, a hurtful view. I'm, it's, it, it's astounding to me that that's the reason why, but, um, <clears throat> they go, they went on in a, um, in a Wall Street Journal article to make that same point also. Um, <clears throat> here to talk about that notion and to summarize the article that I just read. So if you don't want to read the whole thing, you can read some summaries for sure. Um, and another one here, um, of course, Lee Jissom, who was one of the co-authors, of course, he put together a whole, a whole thing here to summarize the long part of the article. But I gotta say it is bloody freaking shameful that just because you think it's hollow and you go into that nonsense that you don't want to publish a comment that rebuts that. That is very much against the purpose of what science is to begin with. You are supposed to have pluralistic views in science to begin with. And tell me how that's inclusive to say you can't publish it because merit is hurtful and it's a hollow statement and what have you. Fine, let them publish it and let the comment rebuttal come, you know? So, overall, my final thoughts on this article. It's extremely thorough. It's extremely in-depth. There are some things that I do think could have been done better. Um, I would have I would have liked to see some tabling out of things rather than, you know, long commentary on it. Um, that's kind of personal preference kind of things. Linking DEI and the critical social justice stuff sooner would have been better also. Because um, that didn't come out clearly until the end of the article. To me, at least. Um, others might disagree. But overall, what I think is good about this is that it's out there and it's available now. And hopefully, um, it's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. Is I fully admit my own bias in this. In that without merit and without the focus on objective reality with science, science ceases to be. Science is... Science's own telos is the pursuit of the truth, not some activist ideology. And frankly, when it comes to policy, then when it comes to policymaking in particular, if it is not based around what the truth is, and you're basing policy on disturbing, disturbing levels of activism instead, that is a way to make a whole lot of bad things happen when you're talking about society. So I, I applaud the authors for doing this. Like I said, I think there's some extra articles. I think there's some extra things in here. I didn't even get into the supplemental and I'm not going to right now because it's <laughs> there's, um, there's a decent amount going on here and that it would be uh, very difficult for me to get into all of that right now. But um, overall, I'm really pleased with the article. I think it was very thorough. Um, Again, I admit I disagree with the notion that uh, merit is a myth um, in here and very much agree with a bunch of the arguments with the exception of, I think, the falsification thing of Karl Popper should have, could have been done better um, also. so But in general, the point is made. And it's actually pretty, pretty sad, the state of different disciplines, that this has to get published here in the Journal of Controversial Ideas rather than actually published in PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or in Nature, or in Science, where it could actually help. Well, no. I mean, this has already spawned a nice conversation. The nice thing about the Twitter science kind of thing is that nature, well, it's a bit like uh, how mainstream news outlets don't necessarily gatekeep, aren't necessarily able to gatekeep as much anymore. This may be in an odd journal that's very much very new. I think this is only like the third year the journal's been around. Um, if I'm reading correctly, let me go down. Yeah, um, this is only like the third or fourth, um, third or fourth volume, so only a couple of years old. This journal, um, but at the same time, who cares because it can get out there on the Twitterverse now quite easily, actually. Um, I encourage you to go read this. Let me know what you think. But I think it is a very thorough article. Um, 
Hit the like button on the way out the door. Comment on the video. Share the video. Subscribe to the channel. All that lovely good jazz. And if you made it to the end of the two hours, congratulations. <laughs> this is the longest review I have ever done because it is a very thorough article and there was a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so until next time, I'm Adrian. I'm going to go down some water because my voice is going to get hoarse. Uh, and until next time, I hope you all stay curious. <laughs>